Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We have God that gives us 
his life.
the Lord in prayer this morning. It's a beautiful day. It's a good day to be in the presence of the Lord. It's a good day to worship Him. Amen. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for Jesus Christ who's come to this world to shine the light of the kingdom of God into this dark world. And Lord, you've called us to know you, to walk with you, to accept you, and to worship you. We thank you for that opportunity. And Lord, we uh, our hearts are just full of joy and praise for you this morning. We give you praise in Jesus' name. We pray that your Holy Spirit will just move upon this place today as we continue uh, studying the Word together, continue with the kids' program. We just ask for your grace and blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated, kind of turn and wave at somebody. We're not doing a lot of shaking and hugging right now, but uh, let everybody know that you're glad to see them. Good morning, everyone. Gosh, this is such a, a great group to see here this morning. And just, you know, this season, the year, we just have looked forward to this so much because there hasn't been a whole lot to shout about this year. But um, we can definitely just appreciate more than ever this Christmas season and the, the joy and, and just everything that means, you know, in, in, our, in our heart of hearts. You know, we are so grateful and more aware this year more than ever that what Jesus has done for us when he came and willing to come to a manger, come to in a, in a lowly state and um, to die for us when we didn't deserve it. And that's something to celebrate. So we're very thankful that you are here to celebrate that with us. And just a few things we want to mention. Um, first of all, if you're a first time guest here today, we just want you to know that we especially thank you so much for coming. And we have a, a gift for you at the welcome table in the foyer today. If you want to stop by there and just leave us your information so we can know um, who was here and that would be a blessing to us. We appreciate that very much. Just wanted to let everybody know a few brought cookies for the first responders. Last week they took eight sets of like three boxes of cookies to eight different places and it was extremely appreciated. We all didn't get to go and watch that happen but just know that it was greatly appreciated and I'm sure we'll be doing that again next year. Just what a blessing. Probably even do it bigger. And uh, Thursday night this week is our Christmas Eve service. And for Tom and I, this will be our mm, 1984. <laughs> no, 39. Surely not. Not since we've been married. Since we were pastors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we missed a few Christmases in there during that time you know when you've heard about that he was gone a lot he was I was home blue navy blue while he's out sailing the seas so <laughs> having Christmas home alone <laughs> I know it's sad it's so sad <laughs> uh, but anyway we've had a lot of wonderful Christmas Eve services over these many years and it's just it's a very special time so that's at five o'clock Thursday and uh, it's just like a 45, 50 minute service, and we just encourage people to bring friends. We'll try to make room for anybody that wants to be here Thursday night. And um, oh, I was going to say to those of you who are online, uh, or if you can't be here, if you're going to be with family, create an event on Facebook. And even if your family is out of town, you guys can all watch the service together. And or if you can't be here, and just gather your family in a home and um, have a uh, Christmas Eve at home, have your own communion, and we will know you're out there, and we will look forward to that. Okay, so the theme of Tom's messages the last few weeks have been Seek First the Kingdom, and his first point was making God's Word a priority, and this year we just want to encourage everyone to do that, and there's a lot of great helps for that, and uh, in the foyer are some Bible reading guides that will take you through the entire Bible this year, or just New Testament, whatever you want to do. But we just want to encourage everybody to study 
and to um, just get to know Jesus, and you will be so blessed. Um, the men's Bible study is not meeting this week, but um, the sign-up sheet's out there for the chosen. They're going to be starting that the first Monday in January. So, bless you guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs> going to set up real quick the kids program. Good morning, everybody. We've got our Christmas play here going on, so I'm going to be the narrator, and you're going to see lots of your little guys coming in through the back there. Two thousand years ago, in the town of Nazareth, lived a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a carpenter. One day, God sent an angel named Gabriel to visit Mary. He told her she would conceive and bear a son, and she would name him Jesus, and he would be the Son of God. Soon after the angel visited Mary, soon after the angel's visit, Mary and Joseph were married. Mary was due to have her baby. And when a new leader named Caesar Augustus ordered all the people to go back to their homeland for a census, so Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem to their hometown. Mary and Joseph, weary from their journey, so, and so Mary being so close to having her baby began to look for a place to sleep. But every home was full, until at last they came to a small inn. They asked the innkeeper if there was a place to stay. The kind man took pity on them and offered them all that he had, a place in the stable where all the animals were kept. Very grateful, Joseph made a place for Mary to rest. So it was a few hours later, Mary gave birth to baby Jesus. Mary wrapped him in cloth and laid him in the manger. On this wonderful night, not so far away, some sleepy shepherds were watching their sheep. <laughs> when suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord surrounded them, and they were greatly afraid.
The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. <laughs> I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you this day in the city of David your Savior was born, Christ the Lord. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Then from heaven the angels appeared and they started singing praises to God. After the angels departed from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing which has taken place. The shepherds followed the star with great excitement until they reached the stable where they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby lying there. Seeing this, they understood the word of God, which the angels had told to them. They told Mary and Joseph the story of how the angel had appeared to them, and they had fallen on their knees and glorified God, and thanked him for what they had seen and what they had heard. Meanwhile, three kings were making their way through the night. They had been traveling for months across hundreds of miles following the star that appeared in the sky. They realized the star was a sign the king of the world had been born. star had led them to Bethlehem where baby Jesus was. Seeing the child, they were filled with great joy and gave him gifts. Kings and shepherds had seen what the angels had told and what the Lord had promised. Jesus would bring love into the world, a love that which would touch everyone, every one of us. Remind us forever, for all eternity, of God's love for us. Thanks, everybody.
give them all a hand again. And, <clears throat> Thank all the parents for bringing the kids early and uh, having them participate in the program this year. It's always, uh, always fun, always fun to watch. I guess one of the kings got lost out in the desert. <laughs> but we work with what we got, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, we don't really know there was three. You know, the Bible doesn't say there was three. We just assume that. So, but anyway. Well, also, I want to give a special thank you to all the guys that got, came real early this morning to cook the food. <clears throat> Had uh, Mike, Mike Collier, he kind of headed it up. Uh, Mike Jones helped cook this morning. And we had Paul Link that helped cook. We had Augustine right here with his chef's hat on. Raise your hand, Augustine. He helped cook this morning. And... Uh, and if I missed anybody else, Tim Jury, Tim Jury, yeah. Tim is great help. He's, uh, he helped me uh, put the sink in on uh, Friday. We put a new sink in the coffee bar. So coffee bar is done now. Yeah. So I made him do all the hard stuff, crawling under the cabinet and working up over his head and everything. So I was afraid if I got in there, I'd get stuck. So, well, it's good to see everyone. You like our new tables? Yeah, yeah we decided... Uh, we decided we weren't going to let COVID keep us from having fellowship any longer. It's been all years since we've had a church, any kind of a church dinner or anything, and we just decided to uh, go for it. Amen? Yeah. And we prayed over the building that no germs will be in here, no germs will spread. If they try to get in here, they'll die. Amen? All right. Well, let's pray. We're gonna, I'm just going to share a little bit this morning. I'm not going to do a full-length message this morning and, and uh, just, uh, just share a little bit of word of God about some things that surround this season of the year that are important to us all the time, but we kind of tend to focus on them this season. Heavenly Father, as we turn to the scripture this morning, I pray that you'll uh, highlight it to us, cause it to come alive, help us to connect with uh, the real meaning of what we're reading and what we're talking about and what we're celebrating this time of the year. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, one of my favorite verses is in the Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, it says, for this reason also God highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, that, that is a powerful passage of Scripture if you think about it. There's so many uh, passages as you study the Bible, they just kind of jump out at you. But <clears throat> that's one of them that's always really impacted me. And this time of the year, we talk a lot about the name of Jesus. We just had a little presentation here. Uh, the angel came to Mary, and we're going to look at that in uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 30 to 33. The angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb a son, and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, uh, and of his kingdom there will be no end. His kingdom will have no end. Uh, you know, just amazing. Now, now the, there's something in a name. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the name of Jesus. Because I think a lot of times, particularly in our Western world with our English language, we don't really connect that much with names. You know, we don't think too much about the meaning behind a name necessarily when we pick a name for our children or something like that. But, uh, you know, names are important. And it's, it's something that God designated was going to be the name of Jesus. So what's, what's Jesus mean? Jesus is a very, actually a very common name. In Bible times. Many of you may not have known that. I'm not sure I knew that all the time that I've studied the scripture. But uh, it comes from the Old Testament name of Joshua. And the name Jesus is a English transliteration of the Greek. The Greek word is actually, if I can pronounce it halfway properly, it's Iesus is, the, is how you would say Jesus in Greek. 
And what it means is, it means Jehovah is salvation. It literally means that by the name. That's what the name Joshua meant. Most of you know Joshua out of the Old Testament. He was the successor of Moses, led the children of Israel finally into the promised land. And so really this, this name is, is a very common name. There was a lot of people throughout the Old Testament and New Testament named Joshua. And there were actually several in the New Testament named Jesus. But it's important to understand that this is a unique meaning to the name that God gave to Jesus. In the Hebrew, it's Yeshua. And so, you know, the, the Hebrew name Joshua in Hebrew would be Yeshua. I'm probably not saying it like a Hebrew would. They have greater inflection and, and more precise pronunciation. But it's Y-E-S-H-U-A, which is the Hebrew version of Joshua. And it means, basically, in the Hebrew, it means to deliver or rescue. Now, we know that's why Jesus came. Amen? He came to deliver and rescue us from the world of darkness, a, a world where we had no hope. Without Jesus Christ, there was very little light into this world. Uh, the Old Testament uh, gave us the covenant of Abraham. It gave us the, the foundation of what would become the new covenant. Uh, it gave us much to look at in reference to God's nature and God's person. But uh, the world had settled into darkness because of the traditional uh, degra de degradation of mankind. Even when you have religion, oftentimes it becomes corrupt, it becomes dead because people start focusing more on the outward than they do the inward. And that was the condition of the land of Israel before Jesus came. They had been conquered several times and been carried off captive and were now under the rule of the Romans. And they had not actually been a totally free people for, for hundreds of years. And so what you see here is you see a, a place where Jesus was coming that was really saturated with darkness. And one of the prophecies is that, that, that when Jesus comes, they will see a great light. That's what Isaiah says that he will come into the world and he will shine a great light. You know, it's interesting that tomorrow night, you know, we, I'm going to try to uh, see this, that the Christmas star is supposed to appear. Uh, and I don't know how many days it'll be in, in existence, but it's the convergence of two planets. I believe it's Saturn and Jupiter are supposed to come together and form a very bright star. And it hasn't happened for over 800 years that these two planets have aligned. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's not something that happens every couple of years. So, you know, we have a, definitely haven't seen it in our lifetime, right? I see some old folks around here, but none of you are 800 years old. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, it's something worth watching for. And I pray that we have clear skies tomorrow night. I don't know what the weather is, but uh, I pray that we have clear skies and that we'll be able to see it. But, uh, you know, it is interesting that, that the, the star symbolizes the light, the coming of light into a dark world. And so we see the name is important, and that's why in Philippians, God says, I highly exalt my son Jesus and have given him a name above every other name. Now, the reason his name is different from all the other Joshua's or Jesus's that may have been in that culture is because he is specifically designated to come into the world as the savior of mankind to set us free from our sin so his name is exalted in that in its position and in its purpose and in the purpose of his coming and it says every knee will bow every knee knee that means those who are already gone to heaven that means those who are in the earth, that means even anything under the earth, will bow to the name of Jesus Christ. That pretty well covers all of the universe. If there's any living beings or living uh, creatures, they will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Everything will come under the rulership of his name when he comes back the second time. We know that. And so uh, it's amazing to see that he is going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom. That's what the last portion of that scripture in Luke chapter 1, it says, and of his kingdom there will be no end. I love Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel prophesies about the whole progression of kingdoms down through the end of mankind. And he says, 
uh, the kingdom of God will ultimately literally put to dust all previous kingdoms and the kingdom of God will rise up in the last days when Jesus comes back and will end all of the kingdoms. There will be no other authority in the world that will compare to the authority of the kingdom of God. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm, I mean, I just am, you know, not just because I'm getting older, but I'm, I'm really, the closer you get, the more you look forward to it. But I am really looking forward to righteousness ruling and reigning on this earth and the name of Jesus Christ being exalted over this entire planet. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because yeah. right now, you know, in most, in most places, most of us are reluctant at least uh, to mention the name of Jesus because of, of, of the pressure, because of the evil that has settled in on our, on our planet. Uh, you know, if you talked about Jesus at work, you could get fired, unless you're the boss, uh, unless you own the company. Uh, you know, if you talk about Jesus in public school or university, you get ridiculed. Uh, if you talk about Jesus in, 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 on the news media or in, in entertainment, you get sidelined. I mean, there's so much going on in our world right now that is not just against conservatism. You know, we talk about conservative cultural views, but really conservatism is directly connected to biblical values. That's what causes people, for the most part, to be conservative, what we call the Judeo-Christian uh, ethic, moral ethic that has been paramount in our Western culture for hundreds of years. Uh, that is now evaporating, that is now fading in most of culture. And, uh, you know, to say the name of Jesus or to talk about biblical values of right and wrong, biblical values of truth and error, out in the public, out in a setting outside of your family or your household or your church. In some cases, even your own household may be divided. And so, but the name of Jesus will be exalted and every, every being, every human being will recognize the authority of the name of Jesus and will bow to that name. Isn't that awesome? It doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved, but it means they're going to have to recognize one way or another that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, and he's not just some uh, good teacher that came through the earth's population 2,000 years ago. And so you look at the, the name of Jesus Christ, it's so significant, uh, and it's so powerful, and it has purpose to it, and God sent Jesus into this world specifically for that purpose, to rescue and deliver us and to save us from our sins. Now, there's another title that goes with the name of Jesus, and that is Jesus the Christ. The word Christ literally means Messiah in the Hebrew. It says that it, it, it's translated chosen one or anointed one. So Jesus not only has the name above every name given by God, but he is he has a title of Messiah or anointed one, anointed by God. If you know anything about the old covenant anointing process, it was very important that the, the priests uh, were anointed to serve in that capacity. Jesus is directly anointed by God. He's not anointed by an earthly priest. He's anointed by God the Father. He's sent here to be the Messiah, the Deliverer, the one to ultimately that will restore all things. So as the Chosen One, He's sent to save and deliver. I love what uh, Simon said in the temple on the day that uh, Jesus' parents brought Him into the temple to be circumcised and dedicated. And, and you know, it's interesting, if, you're, if you read in, in Matthew and the other Gospels, the Bible says that they didn't actually call him by his name Jesus until the eighth day. I found that to be very interesting. And if you go back to look at John the Baptist, you see the very same thing in John the Baptist's story in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 1. When they brought the young child into the temple, the, the male child into the temple to be circumcised and dedicated was the first time that their official name was used. And it was declared before the priests. And that was the, 
uh, like the, the finalization of who they were. And, and it's interesting because it says after the eighth day or on the eighth day, Jesus' parents brought him into the temple to be dedicated. Now, if you know the story of John the Baptist, John the Baptist's father, Zach, Zacharias, doubted because of his age and because of uh, you know, what the angel had said, really kind of doubted whether or not uh, Elizabeth was going to actually have a child. And the angel caused him to be mute for nine months. He couldn't talk to his wife. He couldn't talk to anybody for nine months. Now, some of you guys might like that, but uh, <laughs> you wouldn't have to respond. You wouldn't have to answer any questions about where you've been or what you've been doing. But uh, Zacharias was mute for nine months. And it was interesting because how he got his voice back was by taking a pad of paper or parchment, whatever they wrote on then, and, and confirm that John's name was John. Because the priests assumed, being the firstborn son, that they would call him Zacharias after his father. But Mary said, or Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. But the priest didn't take her word for it until Zacharias wrote on a piece of paper, his name is John. And immediately his voice was returned. That act of obedience and confirmation of what God's plan and purpose was is what brought freedom back to Zacharias and basically, in a sense, healing to Zacharias. And so in Jesus' baptism or, or, or uh, consecration in the temple and circumcision, you have this old prophet uh, type guy that uh, his name, we don't know much about him. The Bible just says his name was Simeon. And it said that uh, he he'd spent a lot of time in the temple praying daily, praying for the consolation of Israel. In other words, praying for the coming of the Messiah, praying for the restoration of Israel. And this, this old gentleman was there and God had apparently revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. So he was anticipating, you would, as you got older and older and older, you would anticipate, if God really said that, that what was experienced or what was expected was coming soon. And it says when he saw Jesus, his, the parents bringing Jesus into the temple, he took him in his arms and he blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine being the parents and you're trying to figure out what's really going on with Jesus? Now, Mary had more information directly from God than probably than Joseph did. Joseph had an encounter with the angel as well. But, but, but it's amazing when you take your child into the temple on the eighth day to be dedicated and circumcised, and this prophet stands up and takes him and lifts him up to God and says, this is the Lord's salvation. Isn't that amazing? What a confirmation. So many things happened around this period of Jesus' birth that confirm who he is and really have supernatural aspects to it. And it gives, us, it gives us great joy to be able to know that these things took place as well. And these all happened around this period of time of Jesus' birth. So Simon prophesied, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation. Wow, isn't that awesome? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm looking, I've been looking forward for almost 50 years to the coming of Jesus Christ. And I, I always say, when I say that, I always say, I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. It may not may not happen for another hundred years. But I want to tell you something. There's something that has always been in me that I have longed to see the restoration of God's kingdom on this earth. And I'll tell you, it is amazing because what is happening in the earth now, if you really are a student of Scripture and particularly the prophetic side of Scripture, I don't know how anybody could deny that we are seeing some things take place in our culture and around our world that are very significant, very significant. We don't set dates, we don't project times, but I'm just telling you, there's some things lining up around the world, not just in our country, but around the world that are significant. And I want us to keep our eyes open over this next year or two to see 
how these things really come together. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that, Daniel that there will be a global empire that will form and it will be led eventually by the Antichrist. Now, the, I believe that this global empire, this global community is forming now. And he's not going to, the Antichrist is not going to step into place immediately. It's going to be pretty well fully formed and he will step in as a world ruler. So I want you to keep your eyes open. I don't know if that's happening right now, but there's a lot of stuff moving around the globe, a lot of aspects of globalism. Uh, if uh, if, if uh, the new president-elect, can't think of his name. <laughs> very, very significant person in my life, you can tell. No, I was just kidding, Biden. Uh, if he is put into office, I think he'll just be a shell uh, for this force to work through him. I have no doubt about that. And uh, I think you're going to see our country rush headlong into all kinds of global agreements and things that are going to hinder our country and hinder our economy and hinder our freedoms as individuals. So we need to be aware of that. Don't just close an eye to that. At least go to prayer about it and use that as points of intercession as we see these things coming. What does the Bible say? Jesus himself said, as you see these things being fulfilled, as you see the day approaching, look up because your redemption is drawing near. So that's a command for all of us. Whether you're interested in end time prophecy or not, uh, be aware if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, be aware there's things that can change very rapidly in our culture. Amen? But one thing we have the assurance of, Jesus Christ is the name above every name, and at that name, every knee will bow. Amen? Every knee will bow. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, for your presence. We thank you for this wonderful church family. We love getting together and sharing the joy of the Lord together and sharing the fellowship and the bond of your spirit together. Now, Lord, as we move into Christmas week, I pray that you'll give us health and strength and peace and great joy with those who we'll be celebrating with, with our families and our loved ones. And God, we thank you for your uh, just supernatural protection over our households and over our families. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for coming today. Why don't we uh, stand if you're at a place where you can stand? I know some of you are kind of crammed in there, but uh, we're going to close in a, uh, a worship, a Christmas worship song, and then we'll dismiss you.
bless you guys. Go in peace today, and uh, we hope to see you on Christmas Eve uh, for our candlelight service at 5.30. What did I say? 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, sorry. I got corrected.